In this video, we're going to do a brief introduction to statistics. So statistics is its own branch of mathematics, so we're honestly going to barely scratch the surface. But statistics involves collecting, organizing, analyzing, and interpreting information called data. So we have two categories of statistics. We can talk about descriptive statistics, which organize and summarize the data. So in other words, if we just want to determine what patterns we're seeing, organize the information we have, um, then we're looking at descriptive statistics. If instead we want to use our data to then make generalizations or draw conclusions, extrapolate what we're seeing, then we're looking at inferential statistics. We're gonna focus on descriptive statistics. Our mathematical skills at this point don't go far enough to go into the inferential side of things. So we're gonna focus on just describing what we're seeing um, based on the data we have. So first thing we need to talk about is a population and then from, from that population, um, samples. So when answering questions statistically, we first consider the population. So the population is the set containing all people or objects whose properties we're interested in. So if the idea is to answer a question about a particular group of people or things, something about it, do we want to determine if there are any particular noticeable patterns? What are we collecting the data about? That's called the population. So the population is what we're describing ultimately. In many cases, however, it's difficult or, difficult or even impossible to collect data about the entire population. In other words, maybe we can't actually go to every person in this population and ask them this question and collect data about every individual. So instead of actually collecting data about the entire population, we may just take a sample, in other words, a subset of that population, and then draw conclusions from what we see from the sample. What we see about the sample, depending on how good the sample is, we can think of as a representation of what we might expect from the entire population. So think of the sample as representing the group as a whole. Whatever we can determine about the sample, as long as the sample is um, well described, well defined, um, we can then extend and assume that's what we might be able to determine about the population as a whole. So in this instance, picking an appropriate sample is gonna be very important. If we don't pick the right kind of sample, then we're not gonna get good data. So samples that might contain some kind of bias are not going to give good data. Ultimately, we want to have the most random sample possible. By selecting a random sample, we know we're not gonna have data that's favored in one direction versus another. We're gonna have data that's most representative of the general population as a whole. A random sample is obtained in such a way that each population member has an equal chance of being selected. In other words, we're not favoring one particular member of the population or one particular category within the population over another. Everyone is ultimately selected randomly. So let's look at an example and let's talk about the population and what a sample might look like based on this particular situation. So a group of hotel owners in a large city decide to conduct a survey among citizens of the city to discover their opinions about casino gambling. So the first thing we wanna do is describe the population. In other words, what is the group we're trying to determine information about? Well, in this case, we want to determine the opinions of this city's citizenry about a casino gambling. So the group we're trying to answer this big question about is the citizens of the city. So the population would be the citizens of the city. Okay, now imagine trying to go through a large city, for instance, Houston, Houston's a large city. Imagine trying to go through Houston and actually survey every single person in the city of Houston. Is this realistic? Well, probably not. The actual um, logistics of doing something like that are pretty unrealistic. So rather than actually surveying the entire population, in this case, the entire city of Houston, we actually take a sample. We'll take a sample of that population, and based on what we determine about that sample, we can assume that more than likely this would be what we could determine about the population as a whole. So one of the hotel owners suggests obtaining a sample by surveying all of the people at six of the largest nightclubs in the city on a Saturday night. Each person will be asked to express his or her opinion on casino gambling. What is the problem with this sampling technique? 
Well, think about the sample that's been obtained. The sample is very specific in terms of the people being sampled. In other words, the subset within the population. It's a very, very specific subset. They were determined by going to um, the largest nightclubs in the city on a Saturday night. So what's the problem with this? Well, the problem is that the sample in this case may be inherently biased in favor of gambling. If the idea is to get an accurate representation of what the whole city citizens actually think, um, we've really selected a very specific category within that population. So by focusing our sampling technique on such a small group and such a specific group, we've eliminated the random component of it and we're probably not gonna get the best data. This particular sample will potentially be biased in favor of gambling and the potential for being against it is not necessarily represented as well here. So this sampling technique, going and finding a sample of the population in this manner, is maybe not gonna be the best option. So let's look at some other options and let's think about what the best option might be. So which of the following samples would be most appropriate instead? So option one would be randomly surveying people who own oceanfront condominiums in the city. Option two would be to survey the first 200 people whose names appear in the city's telephone directory. And option three would be to randomly select neighborhoods of the city and then randomly survey people within the selective neighborhoods. Ultimately, the goal is to make the sample as random as possible. If a, sam if a sample is selected randomly in terms of the individual um, objects or people within the sample, then it's going to be most representative of the entire population. It's less likely that we're going to choose particular, um, particular people to go into the sample that are going to be biased in a specific way. So ultimately, the most random sample in this one would be option three. If we were to randomly select neighborhoods, then we're not focused on any one individual part of the city. And if we randomly select people in the neighborhood, then ultimately it randomizes it further. So option three is the best option in this situation because the sample is the most random out of the three, it's gonna be most representative of the entire population and we're less likely to create a sample where there's some inherent bias. So once we select the sample, the idea is that we'll then administer the survey to that particular sample and we'll collect data from that particular sample. Now once we have the data, it's important to be able to organize the data in a meaningful way. Just looking at individual pieces of data, we call that raw data, is usually not very meaningful and it usually can't give us a lot of information. So the goal is to take the data that we have and then organize it in such a way that we can infer what we need from it and we can readily see what the patterns are and we can answer the kind of questions we need to answer. So now we're gonna look at some different ways we could take data and we could represent it in a meaningful way. So in all situations where data items repeat, in other words, we're not just gonna have a bunch of different random data items, we have data items that end up repeating. One possible representation is going to be a frequency distribution. So a frequency distribution is going to be a table consisting of two columns. So we have numerical data, we're gonna make that assumption. Numerical, numerical values are listed in ascending order, in other words, smallest to largest. And then the number of occurrences of each data item are listed beside the data value. So in other words, we're going through the whole list of data items, we're determining what are all the different options for those repetitive data items, and then we're just counting how many times we see each of the items. So let's look at an example. The data items below represent the age of maximum annual growth for 35 boys. Construct a frequency distribution for this data. Okay, so we need to go through the list of data. All of these are all random pieces of data. They're raw data. We need to go through all the raw data and we, do to deter we need to determine what are the different data items we see, keeping in mind, of course, that there will be repetition. The idea is what are all the different individual data points that we could see? And then we're gonna count how many times we see each of them. Well, it looks like the lowest number in the group is gonna be the number 10. So 10 will be the lowest data point. 10 will be where we start our frequency distribution. And then it looks like the largest number in the group is gonna be 18. So 18 will be where we end our frequency distribution. 
As of right now, we don't necessarily know that all the numbers in between 10 and 18 are represented, but we're gonna check for that as we go. We're going to assume for the moment that they are. So the idea is all the different values from 10 to 18 in terms of the age at which each boy had maximized annual growth, each of those values is in this collection of data. We just wanna count how many times we see it. So over on the left-hand column, that's gonna be the age of maximum growth. And then the right-hand column is gonna be the frequency for that particular age. Now, because we have data for 35 boys, one thing we're gonna notice is that as we take all the frequencies, if we were to add those frequencies up, in other words, the frequency at which we see each of those data values, they should add up to be exactly 35 because 35 individuals were surveyed and we should have 35 data points in this particular collection. That's one way to make sure that we've actually covered everything and we've actually organized every piece of data in this collection. So try to think of a methodical way to go through the data. Essentially, we have to go through and we have to look at every single data point and we have to make sure we categorize it. So let's start with the number 10. So 10 was the lowest number we had in this particular data set. How many times do we see 10 in the list? So you're gonna to have to scan the list. We see 10 one time right there. Do we see 10 again? Well, it doesn't look like we see it anywhere else in the list. So that means the data point 10 occurs with a frequency of one. There's only one element matching 10 in our particular collection of data. Well, the next option would be 11 if we're going in ascending order, so smallest to largest. So now we wanna determine, well, how many times is the data point 11 in the list? It's possible it doesn't appear, in which case we wouldn't need to put it, or we could just put that it has a frequency of zero. So again, we're gonna scan the list, we're gonna keep going. So there's an 11, so we see 11 once, and then we have another 11 a little further on. So we have 11 occurring at a frequency of two. Now we're gonna to go to 12. So there's a 12, so one, two, three, four, five. So the data point 12, excuse me, occurs with a frequency of five. Now 13, so one, two, three, four, five, six, so 13 occurs, let's see, did I miss one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Excuse me, I miscounted. It's very easy to miscount in a situation like this, so do a double count. If I put six here at the very end, it probably wouldn't have added up to 35, in which case I need to go double check. So 13 occurs with a frequency of seven. Okay, now let's go to 14. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 14 occurs with a frequency of nine. Okay, 15, so scan the list. There's our first 15, so one, two, three, four, five, six. It looks like that's it, so six. 16 is one, two, three, okay, so three, 17, there's one, and then 17 doesn't occur again in the list, so it has a frequency of one, and then 18 was our maximum value. We know it appeared here the first time. Does it appear again? No, looks like it doesn't, so that goes to a frequency of one. So this is our frequency distribution. It tells us how the data is distributed in terms of how many times we see each data point. So to verify that we've actually gone through the whole thing, we do need to add up the frequencies and make sure they add up to 35. So one plus two plus five plus seven plus nine plus six plus three plus one plus one. And sure enough, that adds up to 35. So that tells us we've categorized every data point in the list. Now there's always the possibility that maybe we counted something twice or we mislabeled in such a way that it still adds up to 35 but it does certainly lessen the chances of doing something like that. So what can we determine from the frequency distribution? 
Well, most importantly, we can determine the data points that occur most frequently. That's one of the uses of a frequency distribution. So notice the data point occurring most frequently is going to be the data point 14. And the next highest values are the ones around the data point 14. So more than likely, we could say that maybe 14 seems to be the average, in a sense. It's the average um, age at which we have maximum annual growth. Um, if we were to assume that this sample is then representative of a larger population. The least frequent ages for maximum growth, notice those were the ones that were on the tails in terms of the lowest number and then the highest numbers represented in our table. So that's going to be a frequency distribution. Now let's look at a frequency distribution that's changed a little bit, altered a little bit to be maybe slightly more meaningful um, in different situations. So if there are many possible data items or if the data items are very spread out, creating a frequency distribution may be tedious and it may not be very, it may not be very meaningful in terms of looking at the table and understanding what we need to see. So to better organize the data, we can also group the items into classes based on some shared characteristics. So rather than making a list of every individual data item, we're going to group data items together in some type of meaningful way. And then we're just gonna count how many data points appear within each class, which in, within each category. So we call this a grouped frequency distribution because we're grouping the data points and we're just looking at frequency within the group. So each group we're going to call a class. So we're gonna have multiple classes within our data set. So each class consists of a lower and an upper limit. The lower limit tells us where this group is gonna start and the upper limit tells us where this group is going to end in terms of assigning individual data points to this particular class. The difference between the two limits is called the class width. It's the size of this particular group. Now when we assign the classes, when we determine what our classes are going to be, this class width should be the same for all our classes, except probably the first and the last. That's a potential to have a different size. So essentially we're going to develop classes so that they're structured around where our data seems to accumulate. And then data points that are excessively low or data points that are excessively high may fall into a class that's a little bit larger. That way we don't have to create a class for, for instance, a set of data points where maybe there's only one that exists that falls within that category. So varying the size of those in classes is gonna allow us to deal with what we call outliers. In other words, data points that are excessively far away in either direction from where we think of our data being centralized. Okay, so the following data represents student test scores for 40 students. Okay, so we know there's 40 data points. We know that we have to organize 40 pieces of data and our frequency should add up to 40 when we look at the frequency for each group. We wanna construct a grouped frequency distribution using the classes 90 to 99, which represents A's, 80 to 89, which represents B's, 70 to 79, which represents C's, 60 to 69, which represents Ds, and then zero to 59, which represents Fs. Now, why are these classes appropriate? Well, notice all the classes we're developing. They're all based on letter grade, and notice the class width is the same. So the size, the range from the lower limit to the upper limit of each class, so 90 to 99, 80 to 89, 70 to 79, and 60 to 69. Notice the class width is going to be the same for all four of these classes, except for the class representing Fs. So Fs, that's going to be our starting class. That's going to be the first class. And remember, we did say that potentially the first and last classes could have a varying width. They could be a little larger than the original class width for the other categories. In order to deal with those situations where maybe a data point just falls further away from the other data that's centered around a particular number. So if we go in ascending order, we're going to list all the lowest scores first, then going up towards the higher scores at the very end. And so we have in this case, one, two, three, four, five classes, each one representative of the five possible letter grades.
Now again, we can organize this in a couple ways. I've added in an additional column for tallying. In other words, if you wanna go through the list one element at a time, rather than trying to go through the list class by class and find all the elements that fall within a class, that is an option to help you develop your frequency distribution, or in this case, your group frequency distribution. So what you can do is each time you go to an individual data point, just going across the whole um, data set, you can then just take that particular one and use the tally mark to determine what class that particular value falls in. So for instance, we start with 82. 82 would fall into the range from 80 to 89. So I would put a tally mark there to indicate that that particular data point goes there. Then I can move on to my next one, which is 47. Well, 47 would fall within the range from zero to 59. So I'd put a tally mark there. This is going to allow me to go element by element rather than having to scan the whole collection of data for each class, one class at a time. You can do it that way, or you can use the tally marks and you can go one element at a time. So my recommendation is take a minute, pause the video, go through the whole list, and make sure that you can either tally up all 40 elements, or again, if you just wanna look class by class, so zero to 59, you're looking for how many elements in the collection fall within the range from zero to 59. Again, you're counting the frequency. How often do you see elements that fall within that range? So take a minute if you want, pause the video, make sure you can go through and you can categorize all 40 data points. Once you do so, you should get a frequency of nine for the first class, six for the second, and then 11, nine, and finally five for the highest class. And so this is going to end up totaling 40, which is what we expect because we had 40 students and then 40 data points. So it's a frequency distribution, but it's just organized in a slightly different way. Maybe we're not interested in individual grades because notice how many different individual grades there are in this table. If there are this many individual grades in the table, then constructing something like just the basic frequency distribution we'd have to list every single score that's available, and there are gonna be a lot of scores that are only listed one time. So in terms of sort of developing a pattern, determining what scores seem to be most common, what letter grades seem to be most common, it's gonna be hard to determine something like that because we're going score by score. If instead we're looking at ranges of scores, then it's easy to pick out the fact that C seems to be the most common grade, and then Fs and Bs are the next most common grade. We can determine what we're looking at a little bit more meaningfully because we've then grouped our data points meaningfully. Okay, another type of diagram we can use to organize our data is called a histogram. And from a histogram, we can create what we call a frequency polygon. So we're gonna take a frequency distribution and we're going to represent it in a slightly more visual way. So a frequency distribution does take our data and make it a little bit more visual. This is gonna take it one step further. So a histogram is gonna be a vertical bar graph, specifically where the bars are going to touch. So the bars are gonna be written or drawn in such a way so that one backs up to the other all the way from the start of the graph to the end of the graph. So the horizontal axis on the histogram, on the graph, is going to be labeled with the data values. In other words, what values did we have for our different data points? If we need to skip some values, maybe we're missing one particular value and we're not actually going to have a bar there, we're going to use this little symbol. So this symbol, if you were to see it on the table, just tells you that suddenly we're skipping and then there's a bunch of elements that have not been included just because they're not needed for our particular um, graph. Now the height of each bar is given by the frequency of the particular value. So however high the bar is tells us how frequently we saw that particular data point. So what that means is visually speaking, the higher the bar is, the more frequent that particular data point appeared in our set of data. It's a more visual way to look at our, um, to look at our data and understand what we're looking at, understand patterns, what's common and what's not. Now, if we take this histogram and then draw a dot at the top of each bar right in the middle, so the halfway point along the bar, 
and then connect each of these dots with a line segment, what we draw is a line graph called a frequency polygon. So it's just another way, again, of looking at the data um, so that it's a little bit more meaningful and so we can extrapolate what we need from it. So let's use the frequency distribution for the age, um, the maximum age of annual growth, the one we looked at in the first example. And from it, we're gonna draw a histogram and then the frequency polygon. So let's go back and let's look at that. Okay, so here is our frequency distribution. We had ages ranging from 10 to 18. And then based on our collection of data, we had the associated frequencies. In other words, how often did that particular data point appear? So notice we only need data values from 10 to 18. We're not actually starting at zero. So I'm gonna start by labeling my axes. The horizontal axis in this case is labeled with the actual data values we see, which in this case were ages for maximum growth. So we go from 10 to 18. So right there at the start of the graph, I'm going to draw that symbol to indicate that we're not actually starting with zero. We skip some numbers and then we start with the only data point that's actually valuable for, valuable for us, the lowest one, which in this case is going to be 10. And then we end at 18 and we don't need to label anything further than that. The vertical axis is going to be the frequency. So the highest frequency we have in this particular distribution is gonna be a frequency of nine. So that means the vertical axis only needs to go up to nine or maybe 10 if we wanna have a little extra space at the top of the graph. So I'm going to label that with all of the different frequency values, representing of course the number of boys that have that particular age as their maximum annual growth age. So from that, we're then going to draw our bars. So notice how I've spaced the actual data values. We label the bars such that the data value is in the center of the bar and the bars are one next to each other. So they're all adjoining and there's no space between the bars. So the, let's see, let me fix that, sorry. So the age of 10, there was one boy in the group that had that particular age as his age of maximum growth. So that means the bar for 10 is only going to go up to a height of one vertically. So we draw our bar centered around that data value. I've structured it so that I go one unit out in either direction to draw the bar. And then of course we just go up to the correct height, which in this case would be one. Now I've spaced the data points two units apart so that when I draw the next bar, the next bar starts at the halfway point between the two data values. So space them enough so that you can draw the bars um, where the data value is centered. So the value of 11 occurred at a frequency of two. So that means we're going to have a taller bar. We're gonna have a bar of the same width, but the height of the bar is going to be two because we have a frequency of two for that particular data point. Now the values get larger. So 12, 13, 14, 15 are going to be five, seven, nine, and six. So each of those bars gets increasingly higher until we max out at 14, which is where we had the highest distribution value. That's where we had the frequency of nine. And then 15, we start declining again. So 15, we had a frequency of six. 16, we had a frequency of three. 17 was one and then 18 was one as well. And so now our distribution drops off. So once we have all these bars drawn, that's gonna be our histogram. It gives us the same information as our frequency distribution, just in graphical form rather than in tabular form. But it's very easy to see at this point where the maximum age of growth seems to be clustered. Clearly 14 is going to be the value that is representative of most of those boys. And then the ages around that tapering off with a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 18 tells us um, what, the, what the range is at that point and what the different values and their frequencies are. So this is a more visual way to understand the frequency in that table. Now, once we have our histogram, we can then what we call, we can then draw what we call a frequency polygon. So take all of your bars, you're going to draw a point in the very center of each bar at the top. So your point is going to line up with that location where you labeled the data value if you've spaced everything well. 
So draw all of those points centered in each of the middle of the bars. And then you're draw, gonna draw a line segment connecting each of them. Now for the two bars at the very end, you're going to then connect a line down to the axis at that point, down to that horizontal axis. And so the line graph that you get by connecting all of those points from bar to bar, from point to point, is what we call the frequency polygon. It's just another visual representation for our data. It means essentially the same thing as the histogram. It's just another way of looking at it where we don't actually need the bars. So we could have this superimposed on the histogram with the actual bars, or we could remove the histogram and we could just look at the line graph. And again, it just gives us another visual representation of our data. The last type of graph we're gonna look at is called a stem and leaf plot. So again, it's gonna give us the same information as a frequency distribution and a histogram, but it's gonna list those individual data items rather than how often they occur. So rather than just taking the data items, making a list of them, and then making a list of the frequencies, this is gonna show us frequency in a different way. So each individual data item is going to be decomposed into two parts. One part we're going to call a stem, which we're gonna think of as the first part, and then one part we're gonna call a leaf, which we're gonna think of the second part. That's why we call it a stem and leaf plot. So each data item has been decomposed into two parts. Whatever's first, we're calling the stem. Whatever's second, we're calling the leaf. And then stems and leaves are gonna be listed in two separate columns. Now, how do we actually break them up? Well, let's look at those test score items. So we use this to make the grouped frequency distribution. So same set of data, we're gonna organize it in a different way. So we wanna know what, what sort of patterns are we seeing from this data, what seem to be the most common ranges of scores, but we're gonna represent it in a slightly different way. So first thing we need to do, we need to do is determine what are we gonna represent it as a stem and what are we gonna represent as a leaf? In other words, we wanna look at all of these data values and think of something as being a first part and then something as being a second part that's then um, extended from there. Well, in this case, because all of our data is represented by two digit numbers, one way we could organize this in terms of stems and leaves is to let each stem be the tens digit for the data point in the collection and then each leaf be the ones digit associated with that particular tens digit. Why is that meaningful in this way? Well, keep in mind, we have a bunch of different scores, but if we were to think of representing scores within a particular range, we've got scores from 60 to 69. If we have multiple data points that start with a six that would then fall into that class within our grouped frequency distribution, we can represent that in a different way by just saying we have a six as a stem and then how many leaves do we have falling under that stem of six. So every score from 60 to 69 has the same stem because it has the same six for its tens digit, but potentially it has a different leaf because they potentially have different ones digits. So we can separate this based on the lowest stem we see and the highest stem we see. So it looks like the lowest score in this distribution, well, there's a 47. Let's see, do we have a lower score? There's a 45, there's a 43. Okay, so it looks like 43 is our lowest score. That means the smallest stem we're gonna need is gonna be a stem of four. Now we noticed three scores that fall under that particular stem that have a stem of four and it's a 47, a 45, and a 43. So that means we have the leaves of seven, five, and three falling under that stem of four. So essentially what's going on here is rather than listing 47, 45, and 43, we've just recognized that these all have a stem of four and then the leaves just tell us what actual values are we gonna get. So we get a 47, a 45, and then a 43. Notice these are not in any particular order. So if you were to go through the whole collection of data, organize all your stems and all your leaves, everything that has a stem of five, in other words, it's in the range from 50 to 59, 
everything that has a stem of six. In other words, it's in the range of 60 to 69, and so on and so forth. We don't have to organize the leaves in any particular way. We certainly can. So for instance, notice the range of 70 to 79 has the most data points. We might organize everything starting with that stem, with that leaf of one, excuse me, and then we've got, looks like a three, and then a four, and then five, and then a few sixes, and then a seven and a nine. So we might organize in ascending order by leaf, but that's not necessarily going to be required in order to get a stem and leaf plot. But again, if the goal is to see these are the most frequent data points or this is the range of values where we get the most frequent data points, because of the length of the list of leaves, we can see that the category from 70 to 79 has the most data points. So that means this range of scores is gonna be most common for this collection of data. And then it tapers off as we go towards higher scores and as we go towards lower scores. So think of this almost looking like a bar graph, but a bar graph turned on its side so that the bars are going horizontally outward. That's essentially what it looks like, but now we have actual individual data values listed rather than just looking at a frequency of values. So we've looked at a few different ways to represent data. All of these are meaningful in different situations. The type of graph we used is just gonna depend on the type of situation we're in. Do we have a lot of repeating values? Well, if that's the case, then we may just want a frequency distribution, or we could use a histogram or a frequency polygon if we wanna be a little bit more visual. Or do we have a lot of values, but maybe have classes, maybe have a way we could group our data in a more meaningful way. If that's the case, then we may want to use a group frequency distribu distribution, or we could use a stem and leaf plot in order to list actual values instead of just listing frequencies.